Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that was pretty good. Um, uh, so first lesson of press conferences, always bring Mayor Rivera from Lawrence because he whistles <laughs> the loudest. Um, uh, so I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. This is an incredible turnout uh, uh, on an issue that is of generational importance uh, all across our Commonwealth. Uh, I want to give a special thanks and a shout out to uh, several of the elected officials are who are with us here this morning. Um, some of them are going to get introduced a little later in the program. Um, but uh, for starters, I want to just um, give thanks and recognition to several um, supporters from both the House and the Senate that are here with us this morning. We've got um, Senator Crichton uh, from the land area. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Flynn uh, from the Boston City Council. Uh, Representative Nika Elugardo, Senator Adam Hines, Representative Liz Miranda, Representative uh, Chris Hendricks, Senator Joe Comerford. I'm just going to ask you to hold your applause to the end because they're all fabulous. Um, uh, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa. Uh, we've also got our Boston City Council President, Andrea Campbell, I believe, is here. Uh, Senator Kennedy from Lowell. Uh, Senator Brady from the great city of Brockton, Senator Boncori, Representative Holmes, uh, Representative Mike Connolly is here, and if I have missed uh, Senator Stanley. Eldridge, I saw, Representative Tom Stanley, um, Councilor Asabi George, who is uh, the head of our education committee in Boston, Rep. um, Natalie Higgins. Representative Natalie Higgins. Um, thank you so much. So, it, Representative Hawkins. Representative Hawkins, thank you so much. That's why you did it. Um, <laughs> Is there anybody else that I have missed? <laughs> Sorry, I mean, how can I forget? Right how can I forget? <laughs> Saldi Domenico. Saldi Domenico. Um, Chandler. Senators Chandler. Chandler, Senator Becca Rausch, our bipartisan uh, representative, Senator this morning representing the bipartisan spirit of this bill, Senator Dean Tran. Um, I think Cabral. I see uh, Tony Cabral in the background. This is a good problem to have when you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's that? Dan Ryan. Dan Ryan, Representative Ryan is also here. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is a, you know, it's a phenomenal coalition uh, from, you know, every region of our state. And this fantastic collection of folks is here because a quarter century ago, our state made a promise that every child, no matter her zip code, her language, her disability, her income, would be provided what she needed to succeed in school. The catalyst for this promise was the recognition that in 1993, there was a deep and pernicious divide between the have and the have not districts in our state. A divide that would undercut our state's prosperity and that would put the lie to the American dream if we let it stand. So we said we won't let it stand in Massachusetts. We said we will close this opportunity divide. And the core of how we would make good on that promise was something called the foundation budget, a formula written into law in the 1993 Education Reform Act. But that promise is actually a lot older than 25 years. It's rooted in our state constitution's demand that we cherish public education. Yet today, as so many people across our commonwealth know, this is a promise that we have not kept. In fact, when you take inflation into account, state spending on public education over the past 17 years has actually decreased by nearly 8%. And despite making progress in narrowing that divide between the have and the have nots in the 1990s, we are once again today staring down the barrel of yawning opportunity and achievement gaps. Massachusetts is among the worst in the nation when it comes to the divide between our upper income students and low income students. My friends, this, there's just simply no reality in which that could be considered cherishing our public schools. That's why so many people in this building, and more importantly, and as you can see here today in the flesh, uh, people well beyond these walls have spent years demanding that we right this wrong. And you're going to hear from a sampling of them today. We've advocated, we've written letters, made phone calls, chanted at rallies. Uh, and repeatedly called the question when Massachusetts school children have been told to wait for what they deserve. Today, we're here to say that waiting is itself a decision. Every year that we fail to get this done, we are accepting another class of economically disadvantaged children graduating through our system 
without access to arts programming or computer science or foreign language classes or a soccer team or a school psychologist. We are accepting another group of talented teachers who leave the classroom because it's not worth it for them anymore to endure the stress of overflowing classrooms and not enough books or enough desks or enough individual attention for their students. And we accept another single mom who has to choose between her September bus pass and the list of pencils and scissors and tissues and hand sanitizer that the school now asks all parents to chip in to supply the classroom. My friends, there are no more excuses. There are no more if onlys. There are no more wait till next year's. It is time to keep our promise. And that is why this morning I'm filing the Promise Act, an act providing for rightful opportunities and meaningful investment for successful and equitable education. This bill will fully enact all five recommendations of the Bipartisan Foundation Budget Review Commission and ensure that every district in our state is receiving the resources that our Constitution requires and that every child needs to succeed. We must act with urgency. Let's enact this bill into law before the start of the next school year. And we must also act with purpose. All five recommendations, including and especially the equity provisions, are essential if we're going to walk the walk when it comes to closing achievement gaps. And we must rededicate, rededicate ourselves to the premise that the state will always be a partner with localities in funding K-12 district schools. Right. That is what our Constitution requires. It is what our district for years have been demonstrating that they need. And it's what our Massachusetts values, and not for nothing, but the data, tell us is the right thing to do. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, my partners on this issue, uh, Soldiers for Justice uh, from the House of Representatives, Representative uh, Aaron Vega from Holyoke, and Representative Mary Keefe of Worcester. We'll start with Representative Vega. Good morning, everybody. I want to start just uh, by thanking everybody for being here. A lot of excitement, a lot of energy in this room. Obviously, you can feel it. It's a little warm. Um, two quick shout outs before I get to my points. Uh, Lucas Barros from uh, the Black Latino Caucus Executive Chair. Thank you for being here. Black Latino Caucus is growing this year. We've got some great new members. Uh, we're meeting later on. I'm sure this is going to be one of our number one priorities. And uh, behind me is my friend, my neighbor, and my mayor, Alex Morris from the city of Hoyoke. I'm not sure if he got a shout out. Alex is here. Um, there's a lot of people up here. So a couple things. For too long, our communities have been underfunded and shortchanged when it comes to public school education. Shortchanged because we've put forth formulas here at the State House that we're not keeping up with, be it the charter school reimbursement, be it Chapter 70, be it special needs education, right? Be it regional transportation in our rural districts. These are, these are proposals that we put forth and we're not fulfilling that promise. That said, on the other hand, I now represent the city of Hoyoke, which has been struggling educationally for maybe two decades at least. But now we're in receivership. And many of you think, oh, now that you're in receivership, all the money's flowing in from the state and everything's taken care of. Quite the opposite, let me tell you. We are still looking at a $4 million shortfall next year. $4 million shortfall in a community that now has taken in hundreds of evacuees from Puerto Rico a community that now has a comprehensive plan to turn the city and the school around, in order to have sustainable, inventive change, you need funding. Funding is critical to get this done and make it sustainable. So in order for Hoyoke, Lowell, Lemonster, any other city to turn around, it needs the funding. It makes sure that those class sizes don't creep up over 30 kids, make sure there's the supports, make sure we're not cutting arts, not cutting libraries, not cutting busing. I'm hearing that Lemonster is looking at charging kids, families that are over eighth grade, charging them to get to school. We have an attendance issue already. So this is critical. The time is now. The promise needs to be kept. I'm so thankful to see my colleagues here today, and we're going to get this done. Thank you all for being here. My champion, my classmate, my friend, Mary Keith from the great city of Worcester. Thank you, Erin. And thank you all for being here. Um, 
I'd like to give a shout out to our own mayor of Worcester. Thank you for being here and anybody else from Central Mass because we're all in this together. Um, let's start by recognizing that the state of Massachusetts is uh, ranking 33rd in terms of what we spend and dedicate to public education. And with that comes the palpability of in inequality, the urgency of need, as you heard, and the understanding that we can't wait any longer. We as a state can do better, need to do better. For Worcester, this could mean tens of millions of dollars annually that we are owed to meet our constitutional responsibility to the students of our state. In particular, this would impact how we educate ELL students, how many students are in each classroom, the number of adjustment counselors that attend to the school well being, to the healthy well being, social well being of our students, and finally, that we are able to offer alternative activities and opportunities in after school programs. The, the time to act is now. My own family, I had three children that went through the Worcester Public Schools starting in the 1990s. And their experience was one of great confidence about what our city had to offer in terms of public education. I'm talking about music lessons. I'm talking about special ed tutoring. I'm talking about full day preschool. I'm talking about after school programming. So 25 years later, I think we need to work a little harder to make sure that we're offering these same things that allowed my children to really succeed and to be strong, successful working adults today. So we've heard it from students in Worcester. We've heard it from our teachers. We've heard it from our school committee reaching out to us as leaders in the legislature, legislature, and we've heard it from parents. So the time is now. I think we're all going to be saying the same thing. Let's get on this train and let's make it happen. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mary Burke. I'm the superintendent of the Chelsea Public Schools. <laughs> and I am a proud product of the Chelsea Public Schools. I also served on the Foundation Budget Reform Commission for two years. The Foundation Budget Reform Commission released its recommendations in 2015. I was proud of the work and our recommendations. Many of us in education were hopeful at that time that change was coming. We were hopeful that the leaders in our state recognized the urgent need to address the consistent erosion of funds that were intended to flow to the classroom and to our next generation of leaders, our students. Our hope has waned since 2015 with each passing year. The numbers do not lie. Our student populations have changed since 1993 and continue to change. In Chelsea alone, our homeless student population has gone from 134 in 2013 to 445 in 2018, an increase of 232%. In 2013, our English language learner student population was just under 20%. And in 2018, it was just under 40%. It completely doubled in those five years. Our students are in need of more support, more 21st century opportunities, more resources, more adults in their educational careers, and smaller class sizes, after school programming, before school programming. In Chelsea, we are underfunded in health insurance by $8.2 million, and in special education, we are underfunded by $7.4 million, a total of $15.6 million that are diverted from the classroom and from all of the needs that our students ha have before them. While these are Chelsea numbers, my colleagues across the state will attest to the same changing and shifting demographic patterns in their communities, the same increase in need to all varying degrees. And we are dedicated educators willing to do the work and we do it well. While we commend our leaders for trying to address some of the issues in the past, the reality is the foundation budget, when adjusted for inflation, 
has not kept up with the changing and complex needs of our students, po our student population throughout Massachusetts, nor the financial burden. Parents, teachers, superintendents, school committees, we are all frustrated. And yet, we are hopeful today. The time is now, you've heard it, the time is now to do the right work on behalf of our students and families in the Commonwealth. The time is now to expand access to educational opportunities for all our students, for our leaders of the future. The time is now to adequately fund this work, this access, these opportunities. I am hopeful today that we will finally get it done, and today is the start. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over now to Maria Nella Rivera, a Lawrence Public Schools parent and member of the school committee. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Dr. Marianella Rivera, and I am the vice chair of the Lawrence School Committee and a member of CPLAN, the Collaborative Parent Leadership Action Network. I'm here first and foremost as a parent of a child who attended the Lawrence Public Schools, but also as a physical therapist who has worked in an affluent community and a poor urban community here in Massachusetts. I'm also a product of the Lawrence Public School Systems and one of the very few residents who has obtained a doctorate degree. I can tell you firsthand from my lived experience exactly what the achievement gap feels like and the barriers that are in place for African American and Latino students. My son has witnessed the disparities in education starting in a public school transitioning to a charter school, and now attending a private school. We are fortunate to be in the position where we can provide him with the education that he deserves. But what about his cousins? And what about his friends? And what about our neighbors and our community members? Our educational system is inequitable, and it is predominantly affecting poor students of color. During a tour of the Lawrence High School's ninth grade academy, my colleague and I noted that the students were not provided with math and science textbooks. Teachers were photocopying handouts for students. Many of our students don't have access to the internet at home, and many of their parents can't read or write in English and have a limited education. How on earth are our students supposed to study and work on their homework without the resources that they need? In special education, we see our students being short shortchanged constantly and not being provided with the services that they require to access their education per IDEA law. Why? because special education is underfunded. The top MCAS scoring school systems, like places like Lexington and Weston, spend between 17 and 23,000 per pupil, and a community like ours in Lawrence spends thousands less. We cannot afford to contribute more than the minimum required per, pu per, pu per pupil, but other communities can ex exceed that, and that's exactly why their students are outperforming ours. It's about time we stop calling it achievement gap and address it, at the root source of the problem, it's time that we update the foundation budget formula to ensure that all students receive the resources and the tools that they need to have a well-rounded education and a future filled with endless possibilities. I'd now like to introduce Dina Link, an educator. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Zena Link, and I'm a proud public school educator and a parent of a student that graduated from public schools. Some of you may view the disparities in the foundation budget between different school districts as the tale of two cities. But it is more reflective of the haves and have-nots. Students who have adequate resources and funding and students that do not. A tale implies that there's an imaginative element to the narrative. But working as an educator and experiencing firsthand the differences between well-funded school districts and grossly underfunded ones lays bare the reality of the inequality. I've witnessed how lives of those who are forced to do without unfold and sometimes to dismal results, and sometimes irreversible results. 
I'm grateful to have had the experience of working with incredible young minds in very different environments and districts. But it is obvious that students from well-funded public schools will have vastly more opportunities in life. Some districts have funding, while others do not. These are real concerns, not tales, and they are disproportionately affect students from urban and gateway and rural districts, as well as those with learning disabilities, from low-income families, and English language learners, students with brown and black skin. Having worked in an underfunded district, I've observed the direct correlation between underfunding, mental health challenges, narrowing curriculum, goes hand in hand with the excessive testing and the criminalization of students. Contrast this with the well-funded district that I currently have the privilege to work in and the differences are quite glaring. These students have the benefit of the state-of-the-art theater and music programs, a fully staffed library, travel abroad opportunities, reasonable adult to student ratios, multiple and meaningful field trips, and internships. Moreover, they are fully staffed with nurses, guidance counselors, and mental health support. In other districts where I've worked, these same opportunities do not exist. They have not. Suffice to say, the additional financial resources are desperately needed. It is time for Massachusetts to pass an updated foundation budget formula. Under the current formula, every public school district is currently underfunded. I repeat, every public school district is currently underfunded. In wealthier districts, the figure might be 100000 per cost or less, but in the poorer urban districts, like one I've previously worked in, the underfunding amount can be in the tens of millions of dollars each year. In underfunded districts where I've worked, I've spent thousands of dollars of my own money to buy materials for my classrooms, some as basic as paper and tissues. In well-funded districts, resources are abundant. I've sadly seen firsthand how inequity of mental health care plays into well-funded versus underfunded districts. In addition to the psychological and physical stresses associated with limited financial resources, students in underfunded districts dealing with mental health or special education needs face increased feelings of demoralization, persistent anxiety, and disruption of their learning environment. So when we talk about addressing social and emotional needs, we also have to see how we are complicit in causing them. Lack of funding prevents districts from providing what they should, which is a well-rounded education, complete with art, music, theater, school clubs, and other activities, all in a nurturing environment with a diverse curriculum. By bringing an awareness and an understanding about the true cross of underfunding, by giving every child, every child, an opportunity for achievement, we will begin to generally honor all communities and realize the righteousness of educating students to be pro productive members of society. I'd like to take a moment to introduce some of our mayors who are present here today. There are several. Mayor Dan Rivera from Lawrence. Hey. Mayor Alex Morris from Holyoke. My mayor, Joe Petty from Worcester. Nope. Mayor Stephanie Burke from Medford. Nope. And a man who needs no introduction, mayor from Boston, Mayor Marty Walsh. Nope. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zena. And thank you, um, first of all, um, Look around this room for a minute. Uh, I served in this building 16 years. 
um, as a state representative. And uh, there's been times where coalitions have come together on issues. Uh, but I don't think I've ever seen in one room the coalition on education that I see in this room from, from educational organizations to associations to elected officials to kids to parents to superintendents cities from all across this commonwealth that are with us today and cities that couldn't be with us today that are part of what we're doing here uh, i want to thank senator sonia chang diaz i want to thank representative vega i want to thank representative mary keith my former colleagues i want to thank all the senators and representatives that are here we're also joined by New, new State Representative John Santiago from Boston. I want to thank you, John, for being with us today. I want to thank the elected officials and the state reps and senators that have called me over the last couple of days. Yesterday, two days ago, we had a Boston delegation meeting. And I said at that meeting, it's time to put our differences aside. It's time to not have fights about education funding. It's time to get together and talk about education funding. There are going to be more than this bill filed. But we need to come together and come up with a bill that works. You've heard from speaker after speaker after speaker how the system is not working today for all of our kids in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I want to thank the mayors that are here today. I want to thank the, all of the mayors that are here for your great work. And we're also joined by Mayor Lapichelle is here as well. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Madam Mayor, I should say. <laughs> the counselors. I want to thank Tanisha Sullivan from the NAACP, who's here today. I want to thank those different organizations. We are here today because we believe that every student in Massachusetts, Massachusetts should have the opportunity to succeed. No matter their talents or their challenges, no matter their family's income or their background, and we've heard that time and time. Every single young person in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts deserves a 21st century education. And we as leaders have an obligation to make sure that that happens. I'm giving a speech next Tuesday. And in that speech, I'll talk about how great Boston is doing. And I'll talk about the great jobs that we have and the 120,000 jobs in five years. And I'll talk about how we're, we're working on closing the income inequality gap, and I'll talk about the housing we're producing, and I'll talk about all of the stuff that we're doing today. But the future of our city and the future of all of our cities and the future of our commonwealth isn't standing here. It's standing here. Yes. That's the future of our commonwealth, our young people. We would not be standing here together, all of us, if we didn't think the Education Promise Act will give us the tools to make that a reality. We are proud in the city of Boston to join this coalition. We're proud to join other districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, like Lawrence and Medford, East Hampton, and every Worcester, and everywhere else. We're proud of that. We all have different challenges facing our school district. That's what makes us unique, to be able to sit down at a table and talk about the challenges that we face, because they're all different. We're working to make sure that we meet the, the needing, needing growth, what the kids need in our student population. When education reform happened in 1993, it was, it, it was landmark. It was great. It was groundbreaking. But that was the 20th century. And that 20th century formula doesn't work for a 21st century education anymore. And we need to make sure that we continue to work that, because some of what we talked about are outdated. In 25 years, what's missing is the education research that many of you have provided us over 25 years in creating this new formula. For too long, the Commonwealth has struggled to invest in urban school districts like the city of Boston and other cities. We educate in Boston the highest concentration of low-income students, English, lang English language learners, special ed students, the highest need students in the Commonwealth. That's a common theme. Every one of us can get up at this podium and say the same thing. So that's why this is important. We currently invest in Boston $1.3 billion. I guess you can say we are a rich district. But you can also look at the challenges, what we have in our district. 
We have 65,000 students in the district. That means in our public school district and the public charter school district. This is not charter schools versus public schools. This is not schools versus each other. We don't want, I don't want to get into that conversation because that's not what this is about. That conversation happened before. That should not come into this conversation, what we're trying to do now. We have grown our budget since 2014, over $250 million investment in the city of Boston. We've created national models for education from dual language programs to special need inclusion, to STEM career pathways, to homeless supports. We've also committed to invest a billion dollars in our 10-year Build BPS project to build new schools, 21st century schools in our city. That's not what we're looking at today. We're making those investments on the side. And we know that other cities and towns have stepped up and have built new schools in their districts because they want to make sure that the young people that are learning in those schools are learning in a 21st century school. But we need to make sure the funding supports that. The current education funding results in less net state funding every year for our students. If status quo persists in the city of Austin, we will get zero state education aid to support our students. We will be paying the state for 56,000 kids. 87% of those kids are kids of color. Many of those kids have, have, have situations that we have to support them in the classroom. That's why we must take action. And that's why this collaboration is so important today. That's what this Education Promise Act does. It will make sure the money goes to where it's needed the most. It will combine the recommendations, as the Senator mentioned earlier, from the Foundation Budget Review Commission with a new guaranteed minimum level funding for all districts in Massachusetts. So it affects every district in Massachusetts in a positive manner. This isn't about taking from one area and putting in another area. This is about lifting everybody up. Because in the past, it was too often, we're either going to invest here or there. That's not what this is about. It allows cities and towns to invest in their educational priorities. Without these resources, we will struggle in Boston to meet the basic needs, let alone to be able to address the critical challenges of giving our students the best possible start with, high, with a high quality universal pre-kindergarten program for every single four-year-old in our city. Not every city and town needs that, but this gives us the ability to put, institute that in Boston because we've seen the studies, you've done the studies, that show if we get kids into school at four years old, it makes a difference in graduation rates in high school and in college. And that is something that we have to continue to do. So for our kids, our students, our parents, and for our state's future, let's work together. Let's get this piece of legislation passed. Let's put aside our differences. We all don't agree on everything, but we all agree today that we have to give our young people that, that, that education they need to move forward and be successful. If we want to combat violence in our communities, let's fund education. If we want to combat addiction in our communities, let's fund education. If we want to combat poverty in our communities, let's fund education. If we want to address inequality in our communities, let's fund education. If we want to address racism in our communities, let's fund education. That's what we have to do. Now, the highlight of my day is right now. I get the opportunity and the honor to introduce Jose Cruz, a Chelsea student who brought, a, who brought a little cheering section at the Chelsea Brown Middle School who's going to address us today. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, and my fellow peers. My name is Jose Cruz, Jr., and I am the current youth president at the Explorer Post 109 a registered charter of the National Boy Scouts of America in Chelsea. I'm also privileged to be a youth leader at the Chelsea Collaborative. I'm currently, I'm currently attending the Brown Middle School and have been a Chelsea resident my whole life, something that I'm very proud of. Yeah. The youth in our community endure many challenges. Those challenges can break 
many youth down and lead them astray due to the lack of opportunities and support. However, I choose for these hardships to define who I am going to be in the future. A leader, a community advocate, and a student of life. As teenagers, we are not able to leave our fear, concerns, problems, and depression while in school. On a, unfortunately, we harbor many of those feelings throughout the school day. Those feelings manifest themselves because of several issues that we have to deal with daily. They include but are not limited to violence in our community, poverty in our streets, lack of housing opportunities for low-income families like mine, lack of after-school programs, lack of an adult that we can't speak to about personal and social issues, bullying and harassment based on gender, gender, race, and ability, and many more differences. Lack of employment opportunities for youth. The reason I'm stating these challenges is because I would like for you to understand what condition the youth have to live in in the inner city environment. As you could imagine, to thrive in these conditions is not easy, and this may be the case for many students across the state of Massachusetts. Me speaking in front of you today is a result of many of the decisions that are made in this room. This is a direct result of budget cuts in our public schools. I remember participating in citizen school, and I remember participating in citizen schools where we would travel to Boston and have the opportunity to participate in various apprenticeships. I love this, but we don't have this anymore. It exposed me to new things outside of my immediate surrounding and almost made me forget that I would have to go back home and face all these challenges again and again. So I would ask you, do you sincerely expect us to succeed under these circumstances? Are you aware of these issues? Can you do something to help us? Will you help us? I hope so. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you for giving me a chance to share the ills of many students like myself and being able to speak on their behalf. It's a great honor. I understand your jobs are difficult and you make hard choices every day. But please make the right ones for those who matter the most. Our youth, our future. Thank you, Jose. Jose is going to be a, an aeronautical engineer someday. I look forward to that day. Um, well, thank you, Senator and folks, for um, your leadership in this important issue. My name is Tom Hopcroft, and as the CEO of the Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council, I represent the technology sector here in Massachusetts. Uh, many of the speakers who have gone ahead of me today have talked about the moral imperative and the equity reasons that we need to update the funding formula. I'm here to talk about the business imperative. Technology is a major driver of the Massachusetts economy. 300,000 people are employed by tech companies, another 100,000 in tech jobs across all other sectors, and these jobs generate another 800,000 indirect or support jobs. Together, this 1.2 million jobs represents 34% of our gross state product. We know that skilled talent is the number one reason that companies choose to locate in Massachusetts. And we know that the inability to find enough skilled talent is the number one constraint they have to growth. In fact, according to local research firm Burning Glass, there are over 30,000 job openings in the tech industry in Massachusetts. According to the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education, for each kid that makes it through college with a bachelor's degree in tech or IT, there are 17 job openings, six at the associate's level. We need to give our schools the resources to be innovative and accountable in helping prepare all of our students for the opportunities of the 21st century. When companies cannot find talent locally, they hire elsewhere, taking with them the intellectual capital, 
the support jobs and the individual contributions these people make to our communities and our tax base. We know that more diverse teams are more successful, they make better decisions, they have better financial outcomes, they, they better reflect our customer base, and they create conditions that help retain staff. Yet the tech sector is about three quarters white and male. We know that bringing better education, including technology, into the schools changes lives. The Mass Tech Leadership Council's Education Foundation leads a regional, the Massachusetts region, of a global entrepreneurship competition called Technovation by Iridescent. Just over the last five years, we've helped inspire and support over 700 middle and high school girls from 70 schools in 50 different cities and towns across the Commonwealth. While we are proud of the success, we find that year after year, the majority of the girls who are able to participate come from the more affluent suburban towns. We need to modernize the foundation budget to help level the playing field. Talent is distributed evenly in populations, but the opportunities are not. And it is incumbent upon us to ensure that every school has the resources to prepare our kids for 21st century careers. We need to update and modernize the foundation budget formula to address not just the increases in health care and special needs, but also to provide support for lower income and English language learners. With regard to the English language learners, it's hard to overstate the impact that immigrants have on our economy. Over half of the Fortune 500 companies in Massachusetts were founded by immigrants or their children. And for those of you, and for anyone who has an iPhone in their pocket, Steve Jobs was the son of a Syrian. So immigrants are, are innovators and job creators. There's talent in every community. We need to give every child the opportunity to be the creators and not just consumers of the 21st century. For this, for this reason, we support the, the Education Promise Act. Thank you, and I'd like to turn the podium over to Tanisha Sullivan from the NAACP. Good afternoon. Are we in the afternoon? Yes. Good afternoon. <laughs> Let me be the first to say it. Uh, first, I uh, want to thank uh, Senator Chang Diaz and Representatives Vega and Key um, for your leadership on all of this um, very important work, as well as the numerous state and city elected officials who are here today. I also want to acknowledge the many advocates who are in the room um, who tirelessly advocate on behalf of some of our most vulnerable children because you deeply care and love them. I also want to acknowledge our uh, teachers unions who are represented here today. You represent those who are on the front lines, holding the resistance as we say, standing in the gap every day, and I want to thank you for that. In the aggregate, the data tells us that our students across the Commonwealth are learning. And in some instances, they're outpacing students in other parts of the country. So when faced with so many funding priorities, some may be tempted to say, that's good enough. But good enough is not an acceptable response once we take a closer look at the data. The data tells us that year after year, while we celebrate what the aggregate data tells us, there is a disturbing truth hanging over some of our most vulnerable students. Students from all racial backgrounds whose families are living paycheck to paycheck, doing the best they can, hoping that by sending their children to school in search of the education promised by our Constitution, the cycle of economic struggle will be broken. Black and Latinx students who come from communities that have for decades bet on public education to help realize racial equality in this country. They go to school eager to learn every day. And for too many of them, <laughs> their promises are dying on the vine, suffocated by an educational system that is in dire need of an intervention and a reinvention 
in order to provide the type of learning environment that will allow them to excel, the type of learning environment that delivers on the promise of Brown. And when we layer language on top of economic and race challenges, as is often the case for our ELLs, the reality of a failed funding system is all too real. In a city like Boston, my city, thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. I think he's still here somewhere. Oh, he had to go? Okay. Well, let him know I thanked him. In a city like Boston, some may say, look, you all have a one plus billion dollar budget. Why are you asking for more? Some may say we need to work with what we have and reallocate. Why more? <laughs> we, like so many other urban districts in gateway cities, are facing a funding crisis. And that crisis has hit Boston, it has hit our children, it has hit our, our families, and it has hit our teachers. It is impacting the entire system. Boston, like many other school districts, has been doing what it believes is best, and it is high time for the Commonwealth to step up and do its part to deliver on the promise. I'm one of the biggest proponents of smart funding, equity-based allocation, and spending accountability. I don't advocate for pouring money into a problem without evidence-based solutions at the ready, and that must continue to be part of this conversation. But we cannot keep balancing budgets on the backs of our black and Latinx students any more than we should continue to leave behind our poor, working class, or ELLs. That's not who we are. That's not reflective of our stated values, and it certainly does not help us realize the promise of this country. We are underfunding education on the backs of our most vulnerable children, betting on which of them will figure out how to survive. And as an institution, we've been standing by, accepting that many of them won't. All the while, our failure to establish an appropriate funding model continues to produce disappointing learning outcomes for our most vulnerable. And as you just heard, the impact of that is far reaching. Our children, our families, our businesses, our government, all of our systems are adversely impacted. We're facing an educational fiscal crisis and we're standing at a moral crossroad. If we truly value our children and education, we must come together to deliver on the promise. Thank you, Tanisha, for um, putting a fine point on it. Uh, before I open it up for questions, I just want to uh, uh, pick up on something that Tanisha said, which is recognizing the advocacy organizations that have been laboring in the vineyards, putting together the coalition, turning out the folks that you see in this room. Um, so I just want to give a quick shout out to some of the people that don't often get a shout out, but really deserve it. Um, folks, a, a few of whom have been mentioned, are, are mentioned already, but we've got Massachusetts Mentoring Partnership, Massachusetts Education Justice Alliance, the Collaborative Parent Leadership Action Network, the Mass Association of School Business Officials. Uh, we've got a couple alumni of the Foundation Budget Review Commission itself. Uh, Pat Francomano, I think I saw over here, um, and David Bernalino um, from the Mass Association of School Committees and the uh, Mass Association of School Business Officials directly. Uh, respectively, we've got the Social Emotional Learning Alliance for Massachusetts. We've got Boston Higher Ground, <laughs> Chelsea Collaborative, you heard from. We've got Progressive Massachusetts, Teach Plus, and I'm sure I've probably left someone off that list, but you get the point. Uh, so I just, uh, you know, I know we are running long, but there's a lot to say about this issue. So I thought I'm going to just um, leave it there and open it up for questions if there are any. No questions? Yes. What, what's your estimate of how much revenue would need to be raised or how much this would cost the, the state? Yeah. So, uh, so two, two different questions, both great ones. Um, I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, 
The estimates around this bill are, uh, you know, there are a few different entities, uh, some, you know, watchdog budgeting groups that have done estimates, uh, some from the, fund, the commission itself, uh, range from uh, around $900 million up to $2 billion. And that, you know, the, there are a lot of variables that exist in the formula, so that's why you see a range. Uh, you know, it depends on exactly how we shape the bill, and it also depends a lot on things that are unknowable to us today, as with any other endeavor of large scale in government or the private sector, right, I'm going to look at Tom because he knows, um, that when you are, you know, talking about something that's not going to be fully implemented for four, five, six, seven years, uh, you know, hopefully things are going to change, first of all, demographically, demographically if we, we do our job well uh, in terms of economic development and poverty mitigation, the cost of the bill may go down. Um, if, we do, uh, if we do our job in this building with respect to constraining health care costs, uh, the cost of this bill will go down. Uh, but depending on demographics, the cost could go up, right? And we want to be straightforward and transparent with people about that, that you can't put an exact dollar amount, but that's the range that we're dealing with. Um, your other question was about new revenue. New re revenue. revenue. So just, I want to, I can give you another example here to give context. Uh, it is my firm position and that of many others that uh, we do not need new revenue to start the work of this bill. Uh, and that is why the sense of urgency, right? When we don't make a decision for years and years while we wait to have every penny in hand, um, it's done on the backs of kids like Jose. Uh, so and this current fiscal year, in this current budget, we have increased uh, Chapter 70 dollars by about $160 million. And that's not unusual, right? That is a, that's a lot of, most of that is driven by inflation, right? The inflation factors that are already in the law. Uh, and you know, there's a few different components that, that are put in there. If just again, for the sake of example, we had a billion dollar bill, right? That was a billion dollar once it's fully phased in and you phase it in over five years, right? That's $200 million new you need to find each year in order to get up to full implementation. So we're not actually that far away from that capacity based on what we're already spending today. It is a question of spending it more intentionally, right? By design. Uh, with a plan that we all agree on in advance and um, codify in statute. And then, yes, we are going to need to find new revenue. And that was the case in 1993 when the state first embarked on this journey. And the state legislature and the governor at the time sure did not know where every single dollar was going to come from. And at some point, you know, you make the best projections you can, and you step out on values, and you step out on your constitution, and you say, we're going to do the hard work of legislating and budget writing and get this done because it is what our morals and our constitution require. Can I, say on that? Yeah. Can I just say something on that? Because I think it's, or first is the one of the cool things about the, the, the bill itself is that it calls for a consensus about it. It's not just like, hey, give us this money. It's like, hey, let's make a, uh, an, uh, an intelligent decision about what the Commonwealth can afford today based on a group of people. That's what we do with the revenue consensus um, and what we can get rolled into. And I think the idea of getting it into law now says that, hey, you know, as we make those smart decisions about money over the long term, uh, it can go from maybe we have great years and it can go three years or two years, but maybe we have some in between years and it goes longer. But the, the idea is that it's a consensus. And the other piece of it is that the spirit of the law is different than the letter of the law. And the letter of the law brings us what we have today. And, the spirit, and, it, and that's the, the formula is off. The spirit of the law is you have to do it, period. You have to figure out a way to fund that. And, and for me, that means special ed requirements. I don't get to cheat on how much I spend the law is clear or parents sue us. So I just want to say that, so the law is clear that we have to find um, the, the idea that we have a great education for every student in the Commonwealth, that's clear in the price tag, we have to figure out how to get to it. I also just want to clarify something that, um, you know, look, we have to ask and answer these questions about money, but it's important that we uh, remember the fundamentals that we're not talking about uh, extra money or, or new money, right? The whole point of the foundation budget from get-go was to calculate realistically what does it cost to do the basics, right, of delivering K-12 through public education. The foundation budget is not supposed to capture everything that ever needs to happen in public schools. It's supposed to capture the basics. And this is what we promised, uh, this is what we promised students and schools back in 1993. And in some cases, right, the things that we're repairing, that the Promise Act uh, proposes to repair about uh, the formula started out correct, and they have atrophied over time, and we are updating them to be more reflective of reality. 
some things that, were, that the Promise Act is seeking to fix and that the Commission recommended were things that we never, ever got right, even from day one, despite mm -hmm. good faith efforts. Mm -hmm. And that's money that we have been shorting districts and kids like Jose and the other students who are here with him uh, for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So it's not new money, it's old money mm -hmm. that this bill is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, Sam. <laughs> Um, when the last session ended, the House and the Senate seemed to be still pretty far apart um, on the funding reform question. What uh, gives you the confidence that the bill can get done before the start of the next school year? Uh, a few things. First and foremost, I would say this. <laughs> okay. um, And you know, the, the, the momentum and the progress that the legislation made last session didn't happen by accident. It happened in large part because of this, right? Um, legislators uh, on the House and the Senate side uh, and local school committees and superintendents, right? They were hearing from exactly the people that you see in this room and the people that stand behind them about the real pain that districts, large, small, rural, urban, suburban, have been experiencing for years. Um, so this is not gonna go away, right? And that pain is not gonna go away. Uh, so that momentum, I think, is one thing. Another, uh, another uh, factor that I think is, you know, gives me optimism is that, there are, that many folks on Beacon Hill in the time since the end of legislative session last July have expressed that this is a priority issue um, that we are going to tackle this year. Uh, and then finally, uh, and equally importantly, I would say it's time. Uh, we, were, we were very compressed at the end of the legislative session. Uh, by the time we got a bill through both chambers, and into conference committee, we had a mere week. Uh, and we worked feverishly for that week in the conference committee. Um, but a week is a very small amount of time to negotiate a bill of this scale. Where, you know, this is, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, something of generational scale um, and statewide uh, breadth. Uh, so we're going to have more time uh, to get it done this year. <coughs> yeah. Uh, has said in his inauguration that he's going to be filing legislation to address the funding formula. What are the implications of having two competing bills, and could that impede your ability to have this done by the next school year? I, you know, I've now been in this building for 10 years uh, as, a, as a senator, and uh, I, I can tell you without hesitation that whether, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so no, I don't worry about that. Uh, you know, we're going to have a healthy, small-D democratic debate about this. Um, but I do think it is important to, that we should not act as though this is sort of the first time, right, that we're coming to this issue or we're coming to this debate. It has been, uh, you know, depending on when you start the clock, I'll start in the middle. Uh, it has been about eight years since uh, the work to get the Foundation Budget Review Commission, previously called the Adequacy Study, right, first really um, started in earnest. And it has been three years since that bipartisan commission um, gave us, the legislature, a very clear roadmap of how to fix the broken formula. And so there's been a lot of work done on this already. There's a lot of bipartisan um, vetting that has gone on. That is what, you know, the, the commission itself was a bipartisan commission um, that really did a deep dive. We spent a lot of hours together, some of them in this very room, um, um, duking it out, right? And, and we came out with a unanimous set of recommendations from that commission. The Committee on Education, uh, which is a bicameral, bipartisan uh, sampling of legislators uh, from the legislature, also endorsed the bill unanimously. Um, all seven members of the Republican caucus, uh, now six, but uh, that seven of um, endorsed the bill, were co-sponsors of the bill. Uh, so there's a lot of momentum behind this proposal, and we think there's no reason what we can't pick up where we left off. And it would be, um, I think, a disservice to students to completely sort of, you know, throw out the window all that work that's been done over previous years and go back to the drawing board. And I should mention also that the, commission, the then uh, commissioner of education uh, may he rest in peace, was, uh, was a member of the Foundation Budget Review Commission and was at the table for all of those deliberations and all of that vetting. I'd be interested in asking some of the mayors uh, uh, about the idea that the uh, Mass Business Alliance for Education had to take some of this money and say, let's use it to, uh, to catalyze some competitive uh, uh, ideas between different districts to, to do new and creative things, uh, achievement gap closing things, and uh, it may have been, perhaps uh, your, your city has seen some of the this acceleration academy, something, some of those uh, uh, proposals. Uh, what, what do you think of that, of that idea, to have some of the money uh, used for, uh, like, a, like a President Obama's race to the top? You know, I think um, well, the success that Lawrence has seen is because 
they've gotten some of the fundamentals right. And you heard about not having um, theater, not having music. Uh, you can ask Commissioner, now Commissioner Riley, that he thought that the secret sauce was um, the stuff that happened outside the classroom in these extracurricular activities. Um, and so that this money goes to that already. Um, I, I get concerned about talking about ideas I get concerned about funding ideas for bettering education without funding the basic ideas that we know works. Um, it was a, I must have run, if I run into one, I've run into ten principals who said, oh, this, is, this great idea about um, the extent using the time, giving teachers time to, to plan, that's such a great idea. We've been telling you that forever. And so we, and because we have, we have an extension, extended class, because we have an extended day, what we do with some of that time in the extended day is teacher get, teachers get, their kids are in extracurricular activities and they get to plan. And so, but that means if you want the teacher to be in the classroom three more hours a day, you have to pay them three more hours a day. Um, and so I would say, I would suggest to you that we have the innovation baked in and I, and I would challenge even some of the, the, the idea that, um, that there needs to be new innovation because I'm not sure that we're, we've got the basic stuff right. But take the extended day thing, for example. Your, your district has it, but, but lots of districts uh, have, have not done it. Um, maybe some of the money, uh, maybe some of the money directed at, at extending, the, extending the day in, in uh... No, and I think that if you, if you make the budget right, you can get there. Um, and by the way, in case you don't know that Lawrence does have a collective bargain agreement with their teachers, so it's not like we're doing it outside the, um, the union's framework. And then you just bargain it, and you get you pay for them to come. Now, you can get there, I think, but but you can't get there if, if you don't have enough money in the classroom. What I'm asking though is, would you use this to incentivize that to say, look, there's an extra pot of money for, for districts that would that would say, hey, we're, we'll we'll move to a, a, a longer, the kind of extended day that I guess we have a little bit. Of uh, I'm gonna I'm more. gonna follow what she says. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, let's get this thing right. You know, like so. You want to take a sure. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Alex Morris in Holyoke, and we have a longer school day as well. And Mayor Rivera and I, what we have in common is both our districts are in receivership. And so the conversation for us shouldn't be on what districts should go to a longer school day, but how do we get the, the basics right for every district? So why just Holyoke, why just Lawrence need a longer school day? How can we level the playing field for all districts, right? So why do kids in Holyoke uh, getting cheated on after school opportunities or teachers aren't getting compensated for that extra hour and a half that w they would be getting compensated in, in other districts. And so, you know, we have a talent uh, retention problem in Holyoke as well. So we're in Western Mass. We're not lucky to be in the suburbs of Boston uh, with the salaries uh, and things like that. So we have to be competitive for teachers uh, in Holyoke. But it, for us, it's really about leveling the playing field. We've been under receivership for about uh, over three years now. And, you know, we've seen some of the some of the data move, but uh, as uh, Mayor Rivera alluded to before, we're, we're expected to continue to do more, make more progress with less money. Even under state receivership, we've had to cut millions of dollars uh, out of our budget, lay off teachers, increase class sizes, at the very time the Department of Education is telling us to increase outcomes for students. Uh, mind you, 80% of our students are students of color, uh, mostly Latino, uh, Puerto Rican. Uh, we've absorbed 300 additional students uh, from Puerto Rico after uh, Hurricane Maria. Uh, we certainly welcome all of those students and those families uh, that make our city a better place. But we want to make sure that every kid, no matter what neighborhood they live in, what they look like, what language they speak, can get a, a great education uh, in the Holyoke Public Schools. And uh, this uh, funding formula uh, has robbed our students millions and millions of dollars uh, over the last uh, decade at least. And so uh, I'm just so thrilled to see the leadership here in the Senate and in the House. Uh, and I really believe we can finally get something done this year. I think we have time for one more question. We've got folks who need to get back to school and work. Um, uh, in the absence of a hand, uh, I, I will I'll just sort of you know give a little closing uh, thought on the question, even though it wasn't directed to me, uh, which is fine. Um, which is you know the whole uh, sort of theory of action and thrust of uh, uh, education reform, and, and I'll go ahead and you know say it. Uh, uh, the move to expand charter schools uh, in Massachusetts has been, about, not just charter schools, you know, whether it's um, innovation zones, you know, and all the different sort of flavors of this that we have, has been to um, empower and push autonomy as far down, you know, the, the pipeline as possible and as far to the local level as possible and say, you, you guys are going to be the best innovators, right? You're closest to the front line. Um, you're going to be most in touch with the needs of students and what's moving the dial. And uh, you know we're going to expect results, but we are going to put the, the autonomy into the local hands. 
um, to figure out new and interesting ideas or pick up, right, not new uh, and sexy ideas, but things that are really tried and true best practices that we know are fundamental to getting the job done. And, that, and the Promise Act is really uh, moving in the spirit of that. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about we need to replicate the best, you know, replicate the successes, right, of that movement. And here we are. This is what we're doing. I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and release these hardworking folks. Um, thank you.